All right, going live. <coughs> okay. Morning. Welcome to Grace Christian Fellowship. Glad to have you here today. And uh, you know what? I am so encouraged that, and maybe the person that's watching this will see this, but uh, you know, just this uh, this uh, last week, I had a conversation with somebody that called and wanted to chat with me about something that was going on in their lives, and then because they watch our YouTube stuff, they and they they live elsewhere and way elsewhere, and I was just like, oh wow, and so that. So it's encouraging me that it's good to say welcome to Great Christian Fellowship because <laughs> we have this, 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 this ministry that goes way out there. Other people get to hear us. Thanks, Lord. And yeah, and so, you know, one of the things, that, so well, as a pastor, uh, I usually, I know everybody that's here, generally. And uh, uh, I don't always do like a, a gospel presentation in my service because I, Generally, I know where you're at. You know, you gotta you gotta read the room, if you will. <laughs> but if you guys will be patient with me, I probably will address the gospel more often, knowing that we have people watching our message that might or might not know Christ. And so, I'm not always speaking to you about it. <laughs> It'll be, but you know, I. I always think about this. There's times when, even as 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 even though I've been a Christian for a long time now, I still need to hear the gospel myself to remind myself mm -hmm. of how much Jesus has done. On that note, uh, the only thing I want to point out in the announcements is reminder for Tuesday Bible study for the ladies and prayer on Wednesday, of course, and then October 21st, which is this Saturday, we're having the game night. So from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., uh, we'll have snacks and dessert and bring drinks too. I forgot that, so if you want to, like whatever drinks you want to bring and such to share, uh, that'll be great. And come and have fun and fellowship and hang out and beat your pastor at a card game, whatever it takes. You know. <laughs> so there you go. Is there anything else going on that we need to be aware of today? So before I pray, somebody was talking about Israel and. I'm going to pray about Israel in the middle of the message, okay? And that is something that, because today's subject matter is going to hit that. God's timing in Scripture, imagine that. Uh, so, just let you know. So on that note, let's pray and dive into God's Word. Father God, we just, we pray now as we hit this story, you of two sons. One is chosen and the other one is not. And this is a theme we see in Scripture. And Father, I just pray now is that your word would just speak to our hearts. Lord. We know that part of this passage, Lord, is very applicable even for today as far as events are going and of course we know all scripture can speak to us in so many different ways but it's always poignant father when current events are addressed within scripture so father i pray that you would give us wisdom give us insight Lord, and understanding let us soak into our souls we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One plan, one son. Genesis 21, verse 8 to 21. Probably goes to obvious. God has a plan. How many of you guys, God has a plan out there? We know that he has a plan. And some people's place in the plan can be glorious and awesome, and other people's place in the plan is not so glorious, not so glamorous, uh, for at least from our perspective. You know, from our earthly perspective, we're like, well, here I am. I'm the, I'm the doorman of the house of the Lord. I'm the, I'm the bathroom cleaner in the house of the Lord. That's, that's not glorious, but in God's view, that's glorious. 
And of course, the people that use the bathroom are thinking, this is glorious. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, all the same, we, we have certain ideas about the plan. And God has a plan for salvation, a, a, a provision for salvation for all of mankind that will be, will be and has been enacted through his son, Jesus, and not any other son, because he only has one. Still remember one time I heard a pastor suggest, oh yeah, there was a lot of people that could have been the Christ. I was like, what? I was like, no, there was only one. He was definitively predicted, definitively the, the guy, the singular Jesus Christ, Jesus the anointed one, only one, only son. No other, the, the thing is, is, no other religious leaders out there, no other religious thinker, no other religious guru, no other prophet, no other priest, no other avatar out there is a savior. There is only one, and his name is Jesus. Scripture says there's no other name under heaven by which men will be saved. Yeah, it's his name. It's his authority that saves us. Nobody else. Now this may, for some folks, this may seem unfair. Gee, what, you know, why would God only use one guy? So unfair. Could have used everybody. But God has a plan. And he had to show himself specifically through this one person. And part of this, is the reason it seems unfair, is because you and I, we only have limited information. We have our Bible. It tells us a lot, but it doesn't tell us everything. Tells us what we need to know. That's it. Tells us. Always, always love that. In the, in the Navy, you know, there's like there was commands that would be given to us, orders from headquarters. This is what you got to do. But what about this? What about that? It's like you don't need to know that. You just need to do this. Okay. That's what they always said. You know, some sailors they don't want to be too smart because they'd be out thinking, overthinking everything. It's like, no, just just follow the orders. That's what we're asking you to do. God's one plan was there to reveal his love and display his glory. That's what he's doing. Only one son, only one way. And this morning, of course, we're going to read part of the scripture where it really... Where one son ascends to this position, the son of promise, but another one gets excluded. And that just seems, seems unfair. It's just like, what's going on? But what's interesting is this is not necessarily talking about the salvation of one over the other. It's all part of God's plan. He's like, no, I'm going to use my plan with this one because we're going to see the other son is also blessed, undeservedly, mercifully, if you will. Because <clears throat> one of the sons is not like the other. Beginning of our chapter 21, we saw that Isaac was born. About time. It's been 25 years. Sarah was finally conceived and she had a son right when God said she would. And now he's growing up as a few days into this it's like eight days in and we join him in verse 8 Genesis 21 8 and the child Isaac grew and was weaned notice that song a little bit farther sorry I was thinking about the circumcision that was last week sorry and so the child Isaac grew and was weaned so that means he's about two or three years old so sorry and Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned makes sense this is big celebration this is main kid going on and yet they're going to have family troubles here anybody here ever experienced family troubles no. yeah, yeah not at all <laughs> so they got family troubles there it says in verse 9 but Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian whom she had born to Abraham laughing now remember you know, Sarah had been laughing she's like Yay, I have this child. She's laughing with joy. And everybody else was laughing with joy too. So it's like, this is awesome. But Ishmael is not laughing that way. What it's talking about is a, is a mocking laughter. He's like, ha, whatever. 
from this kid. That's, he's, he's mocking him. And uh, scripture elsewhere, Paul talks about this in the book of Galatians. He tells us exactly what's going on. Uh, Galatians 4.29 says, uh, But just as that time he was born according to the flesh, of be Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So uh, also it is now. And of course, they're talking about the idea of law versus grace. The folks that are trying to follow the law just can't handle grace sometimes. And so there he's mentioning that Ishmael's persecuting him. He's making fun of him. He's going after him. This was not acceptable. Sarah was not having it. Genesis 21, verse 10. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be the heir with my son Isaac. So, whoa, okay, here it is. She'd already tried to frighten her off one time already, and Hagar ran off into the desert, but still came back. God said, you got to go back. you got to do that. But now, in a sense, Sarah was commanding Abraham to, in a sense, divorce Hagar, in a sense. Not formally, if you will, but no, you got to get her out of here. Uh, and in this culture, if somebody was enslaved or whatever, the master could let them go. And that's, in a sense, also a sense of what's happening here. He's like, you got to let her go. Let her get out of here. Um, if the, and especially they could do this if the master was displeased. They could go back home and they could send her out. And uh, in that culture, though, this is a note, children of a freed slave would now not have they would not have the, the, the things that the, the parental obligation that was normally there would now be cut off. That was their culture. Right or wrong, that's just the way it was. So that means, so that's what's really going on. It's like, set her free, get her out of here so that we're not obligated for that other son. He is not going to have any inheritance, which is exactly what she is pointing out. He's not going to be an heir. And of course, this might have been on my, on Abraham's mind is then he says this happened in verse 11 21 11 it says and the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son the great note here so in other words Abraham is he's, he's caring for Ishmael he's formed some kind of bond with him already he, he, he doesn't hate him now Sarah might not is on the other hand might be on the other side of the thing but for Abraham himself he's like He's formed a bond. He, he's, and maybe he loves Ishmael. He sees what's going on. This is his kid. And so it would be hard to cast him out. He's breaking his heart to contem contemplate this. He's like, let him go. I've been taking care of him. Some suggest he was probably about 13 years old, maybe or, or so around this time. <clears throat> and so there it is. He's almost becoming a man. And now he's sending him out. That would break his heart. So, remember how Lot was hesitating to leave Sodom and Gomorrah? It was like the angels literally had to like drag him out. Well, God intervenes on that. And <coughs> provides encouragement to Abraham. Verse 12, but God said to Abraham, so there must have been some time he's praying about this, thinking about this, and He's praying, and God comes to him and says, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For, though I, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So God's reminding him. He's like, hey, I know you care for this kid, but he's not the child of promise. It's going to be through Isaac. And this is a reaffirmation of the covenant plan, that plan, for Isaac. This is the plan. This is the salvation plan. It's not through Ishmael. It's through Isaac. This is the plan. And uh, uh, a while back, a long while, uh, somebody asked me, because we're going to come up to chapter 22, where he's going to take Isaac to go sacrifice him. And it's described, Isaac is described as his only son. Well, how could that be? Remember last week we talked about how God sees things versus how we see things. And so God sees like, okay, the kid I'm working through, the planned kid is Isaac. So in God's plan, 
Isaac is the only one. Isaac's the only one. So that's how that works. He is the offspring. He is the singular one. There's no other optional children. And that's something to consider. It's just like, he's just like God's not like, well, I'm having a lot of kids here. I'm going to have some plan B's, if you will. Or the, as the uh, royal family, they talk about all the other kids. They have the main prince. In this case, I think it's uh, uh, Prince Harry. I think it's the main guy. I don't know. Oh, who's it? Who's it? I can't remember. Prince William. William. Okay. See, I don't know. They never write. They never call. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Prince William's main guy. Prince Harry, of course, he just wrote a book called Spare, which he, he got that phrase from his aunt, Margaret, back in the day. Because she would call herself that. She was the spare, you know, for Queen Elizabeth back in the day. And so there it is. They're the spares. God, but the thing is, God doesn't have spares. God doesn't have spares. And that's why the enemy, when we think about what the enemy does, he goes after that. Because he knows, like, God is vulnerable. He's picking only one. Going to try to go after him. Going to try to take him out. That's something to think about, though. And that shows the power of God in his preservation. But God promised before, and the good news word, and we'll come back to that in a moment, he reaffirms that he will undeservedly bless Abraham's son, Ishmael. Uh, verse 13, Genesis 21, 13, he says, And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So he's not the offspring of the plan, but he's the offspring all the same. And so this faithful decision, uh, along with promises that should bless those that are watching God work from the covenantal sidelines, have caused problems that we see today. And you guys know what I'm talking about. To see fallen humanity, instead of looking at this as like, Wow, you know, what we're going to see, that God would actually come and still bless Ishmael and be with him and help him. All they see is this kid was chosen and I'm not. And it's, I mean, I know that feeling. Anybody who's ever been to gym class when you're a kid and it came time to choose teams, I can tell you the kid who was not the first to be picked. And that would have been me. <laughs> I was always a little scrawny kid, <coughs> smaller than all the other kids, so yes, I was not the first chosen. And so I understand that. And, and there it is, you get those feelings. You know who's, who gets, does get chosen. It's like, there's this kid showing up, it's like, yes, I want him. What about me? <laughs> it's like, and so that's the, that on the one level, on a humorous level, is there. But on an international level, these folks, human, they, 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 it's their, the ire, the anger, the frustrations are stirred up by the enemy to go after the chosen ones. And as I was listening to somebody talk about this just the other day, The Jews are a special people. They are. God has used them throughout history. They are a special people. God's destiny has been working through them. And the enemy stirs up hatred, anger against them in every possible way. Casting blame upon them. As many people have said, they've become the scapegoats for all sorts of problems. Of course, if you study history, you find out that a lot of the times, very people that, that, that they're blaming them for the problems, but they caused the problems that, that were there. I think I've shared before in medieval history. The Jews were just as they went after them then too. They blamed them for everything. So much so that they 
They wouldn't let them own property. They wouldn't let them have certain, any kind of regular uh, jobs or whatever. So they would keep them from doing that. So they became very good at certain things. Very good. They became craftsmen par excellence. Because nobody would ever, nobody would ever let them own the shops, but they knew how to work them. And they did that. What's the other thing everybody did? Where they couldn't own anything, but they could handle everybody else's property, and that would be banking. People like, man, they, they, they disparaged the Jewish community. Like, man, they own the bank. Because you, that's all you gave them. <laughs> Duh. And so, yeah, they would run the banking system because that's all they could do. And they were good at it. So good at it that, 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 it, that they knew what the best figures were and everything. And the kings and the rulers couldn't fudge anything. And so they would go after them for that because they were good at their job. And so... The other thing is, like I said again, I want to emphasize, they are a special people. And we have to remember, the world hates God. I don't think we capture that thought enough. The world hates God. I've described before that we are in a battle. We don't always see it. We don't know. It's not like we go out the door and people are automatically pummeling us the moment we go out the door. I understand that. It doesn't happen. Thank God we live in a country. But other places, they do. I mean, even this last week, not just in Israel, but in Nigeria and other places, Christians are getting kidnapped daily. This is a thing. We are blessed at the moment to enjoy a, a community that at the moment we still have some semblance of safety, some semblance of uh, freedom, slowly evaporating away. We have that. But we are in a battle. And so, you know, it's, of course, like as Nancy brought in the, the pictures, here's, you know, here's the, the papers talking about the, you know, Israel getting attacked. And people like, some have suggested, rightly so, it's like, man, it's just been going on forever. We get frustrated about it. And can't they just stop? And I want to put it this way. A lot of people get frustrated sometimes. It's like, why do, why do we have heated discussions on things? And I've said this before. Truth matters. And that's why sometimes people, when we argue about theology and stuff like that, it can get out of control uh, sometimes because we forget our humility. But there's times when certain truths are under attack and, and we have to battle as gently and respectfully as we can, but it's going to be a battle. Just like my introductory statement, to say that there is only one way, that only Jesus is the way, that, my friends, are fighting words to the world. I've, I have seen it before, and usually in joke form or whatever, but it's so true. You can, you can talk about Buddha six ways from Sunday. You can talk about Hinduism. You can talk about all these is isms uh, all over. But you mention the name of Jesus Christ and it's the fingernails on the chalkboard. Because Jesus stands for something. He made himself exclusive when he said, I am the way the truth and the life and no one, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. Amen. That was, it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't invent that truth. Jesus did. 
So when somebody says, oh, you Christians, you're just so exclusive. Well, because we have an exclusive Savior. But the great thing is we have an exclusive Savior that's ready to include the whole world. Amen. If they believe in him. Believe in what he's done. Believe in who he is. So that's, it's like, he's an exclusionary inclusivist. If you could wrap that one around your mind. <laughs> but there it is. But the enemy stirs up trouble. So I do want to stop right now. Because the scripture, first I want to bring up John 7, 7. Go ahead and bring that one up. Because Jesus reminds us, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that, that its works are evil. It's Jesus. And I thought about this because Jesus did say we would, we would deal with people that hate us. But we have to remember it's not us that they hate. It's the Jesus within us. At least that's who it ought to be. Unless you're being a butthead and you shouldn't be. But if you're living for Jesus, loving Jesus, standing for Jesus, then they're going to hate the Jesus who's there unless, of course, they are at a spot where they are brokenhearted and hurt and realizing that the world is telling them to hate him is wrong. When they wake up, when the Holy Spirit, who's been pounding on them, is telling them, hey, wake up, wake up, wake up, all the time, and suddenly they listen, they're like, oh, the, this Jesus I've been hating is, is the Jesus that I need. So, Father, I, we just pray. We pray for our, your chosen people, Israel, that you still have a future for, you still, they're still part of your plan. And Lord, I, I just pray for their safety and pray for the peace of Israel. Lord, I know the truth is, though, Lord, that they will not know peace until you come. So come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly for the sake of your children. Yes. And Father, we pray for I do pray for those enemies that are all surrounding them. So many of them are being fooled. They are being used and fooled by the enemy. And they are paying an awful price themselves because they listen to lies. And all they hear is, all they want to do is hate. Father, I pray for them too. That you would open up their eyes. Let them see you. Let them see you, Lord Jesus. Let them know you. And we just ask this in your name, Lord. I could go on and on. I have to restrain myself so I have much to say about that. If you want to hear me go off on that, you can come find me later. <laughs> all of this though, like I said he still loves God loves Ishmael so at Sarah's demand and God's encouragement as Abraham follows through Genesis 21 14 so Abraham rose early in the morning took bread and the skin of water and gave it to Hagar and putting it on her shoulder along with the child sent her away and she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba of course, we know the climate there. Don't know what time of the year it was, but it's an arid area. They don't, it's not like there's, there's bottled water in stores just right around the corner. So in other words, they would run out of the, the even though the bread may last, the water supply is gonna be the problem, and that's exactly what happened. Verse 15, it says, then when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes, which is, Makes sense. So that's, the, that's where the shade would be. She's going to put him away, hide him over there. But then it says in verse 16, and then she went and sat down 
opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, let me not look on the death of the child. She sat opposite him, lifted up her voice and wept. God heard that. It is interesting, just that phrase alone, how often the people that God sees, some of them did bad things, and they lift up their voice and weep. We're going to see Esau down the line who gets cheated by his brother Jacob, who weeps for his loss of a blessing. We see Saul later in Scripture when he messes up and he weeps. When David confronts him about what he's doing, and Saul weeps. God hears those things. It's a sorrowful situation. I love it when Scripture captures the broken heart. And here she is. She's like, no hope in sight at all. And that's, that's the thing. No hope in sight. If Israel did not exist, there would be no Jesus. And the Gentile world would have no hope in sight. They would have to trust their pagan gods who don't care about them. As I reiterated last week, none of them ever promised to be faithful. God is faithful. Yet this was, as we all know, as if you've read the scripture, this is not the end of their story. Because God had made a promise. Here he is showing his promises again. Genesis 21 verse 17. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? In other words, what's wrong? What ails you? As the King James says. Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. God sees I'd have hit it under the bush. God sees him. I was like, I see him right there. I know where he's at. I see him. So here God again. This is when she ran away. Hagar encounters the God who meets her right where she's at. For her, in her hour of need and for the sake of Ishmael. He didn't have to. He could just let him go. Met him where he was. That's, I've always taken comfort in that. God meets us right where we are. I'm so glad for that. We could have a God that says, hey, this is, you know, I'll meet you, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to do this, this, that, and the other thing, and make sure you straighten your whole life out before I will meet you. No. He's like, no, I'm going to meet you right there. I'm going to meet you in your despair. I'm going to meet you in your failure. I'm going to meet you with your, when you're at your very worst. I mean, that's what the story of the lepers. When Jesus, Jesus didn't say, oh, don't touch me, leper. He reached out to him. He met the leper right where he was at. That's God. Of course, though, when God meets us, we got to act on it. Genesis 21, verse 18, and, and God says, Up! Lift up the boy! Hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. In other words, uh, lift him up. He's like, don't leave him lying there. Pick him up. Pick him up. Pick up the boy. Knew he needed that action. Needed a little help in the hand. And he said he would make him into a great nation. Suffice to say, God had already made this promise to Hagar in the previous desert jaunt when he was telling her to go back to Sarah. He's like, hey, this is what's going to happen. Genesis 16, verse 10, the angel of the Lord had also said to Hagar, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. There it is. God had made that promise, so he's reminding her. He's just like, hey, I, I already said I was going to take care of you. Here I am. Going to watch over you. Remember, he, and there she gave him the name. Uh, uh, Jehovah Bir Elroy or something like that, which means the God who sees. 
And he sees her now. And he allows Hagar to see something. Verse 19, he says, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin of water and gave the boy a drink. God opened her eyes. I always think it's interesting how God opened her eyes. I feel, and I'm convinced that Scripture says that the Holy Spirit is at work in every person everywhere. Not, I don't believe that he's only working with a select few. He says that he's made this available for all of mankind. We get frustrated. We're like, we tell, talk to somebody sometimes. We're like, man, I've told them 5,334 times about Jesus. And they have not listened. Why not? I'm going to tell you, we don't like this response. It's because they don't want to listen. They have no need. And that can be frustrating because we know our need, his need. We know. And we're like, why? And some people have answered, tried to answer this question and say, well, because, you know, they're just not ever going to do it. Well, I don't buy that response. I don't buy into that. Because that takes responsibility. Or those, some have said that, that God is like, no, he hasn't chosen them, and so they won't. Well, that means it's God's fault. That's the way I look at that. It's God's fault, then, if they don't come. And there's people who, when they look at this, there's a, there's a Christian musician that, that like stepped away from the faith. He's like, I just don't believe. And then, I'm not going to believe until God makes me believe. I'm like, dude. No. Don't blame God. It's you. You're deciding not to do it. But that's how they look at it. I'm convinced that the gospel is, like I said, has been empowered by the Holy Spirit. When you tell somebody the gospel, that, that's the Holy Spirit working. When somebody hears a Bible verse, that's the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is going to use the word of God to speak to them. Right there. That's what his job is. Now, will they listen? Maybe. Maybe not. And that's on them. First, I know that I understand that there's a time when God says, okay, if you don't want to listen, I'll, I'll stop talking to you. That's a very dangerous spot. It's called judicial hardening. And somebody says, just keeps rejecting God, rejecting, rejecting, and then God's like, okay, I see your decision. See your decision, and I respect it. And I'll let it go. Let that person go. But see, I believe God does want to reach, and this passage tells me so. God's care for Hagar and Ishmael are an example of God's compassionate reach to all mankind. So even though He's using Isaac, Isaac's going to be the child of promise. He wants to reach everybody. Now sometimes this is called common grace. Now this common grace term is that is it just a general sense because sometimes it's called general grace is that favor or blessings of God that are granted to all mankind such as rain for crops or any of the general good that anyone could experience in this life on earth. Is they're experiencing the goodness of God. That's just him doing the same. It's good, you know, we have a couple passages that talks about how God is doing that. Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to all, and his mercy over all that he has made. So he's he's constantly pouring out his goodness to everybody. Even that's even the Old Testament, New Testament. Matthew 5, 45, he makes, this Jesus talking, he makes his, his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. There it is, he's doing this. He's showing his goodness to everybody. Romans 1, 20, I don't have it on here, but it says that he's, he's showing his goodness in all creation so that they would know him. Now, how do I know that this would be a method that God would use to reach out to everybody? Well, Paul makes this point. He was in the, in the city of Lystra. And uh, they had a little conflagration there because they saw Paul and Barnabas come in and they thought, oh, he must be, because he was, I think he did a couple of miracles and they thought, hey, this must be the gods, the gods are here. 
And Paul had to correct him. He's like, no, 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 not that. And so then he starts talking to him about God. In Acts 14, verse 15, it says that we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. That, in other words, the useless gods, the meaningless, the nothing gods, to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in him. And a, a couple of verses later, verse 17, he said, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you the rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with good food and gladness. That's his witness, his testimony. He uses the word martyro, where we get the word martyr from. It's his witness. God's trying to witness to everybody. It's like, when we go outside, and, and people talk about this. They'll sit there and they just don't go all the way with it. They'll like they'll look at creation, and of course, then they'll like, look what Mother Earth has done. No, Mother Earth has not done any of those things. The Father God did it. The Father has made these things through his son. And they 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 sense it. They 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 see creation. They're like, man, don't even talk about it. That's creation, but not listen all the way to the witness. The witness of the goodness of God. God's goodness is a witness for all to contemplate. Let's face it, the whole idea is, as I think about it, it's just like, the people will say, you know, how can God do bad things? How, or how can God allow evil to happen? The problem is, is, is the whole idea of when they think it's, how can evil happen? There's one, it, it, they'll say there can't be any God if evil's happening. How do they know it's evil if there's no God? I always love Frank Turek. He talks about the idea that people are, they steal from God in order to fight against God. The whole idea of good or bad can only come from a personal God that's the standard of what is good. I always love it. C.S. Lewis said that too. It's just like, he knew that the, you know, the only way we could know that there was good or evil is the fact that we know something ought to be good. You don't know a line's crooked unless you know what a straight line is. And he knew something was there. And that was God. We're given just a brief follow-up details. Genesis 21, verse 21, verse 21, 20 through 21. It says, And God was with the boy. And he grew up, and he lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, which is down south along the Arabian Peninsula. And his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So there it is. That's just a summary statement of what's happened there. But later on, in, I think it's chapter 25, that we get to see a genealogy and uh, his 12 nations, uh, 12 kids that he had. So very interesting. Um, God was with him, just did as he promised, be good to Ishmael, even though he was not part of the big plan. That undeserved mercy. Isaac was part of the big plan, but he was not, but God was still good to him. And we're, we're all in part of God's plan to one degree or another. And yet, we're not the star player. We're not the star player. We always like to think we are. We're like, look at me, how great I am. It's just like, no, because there, there's only one star player. It's been, that role has been given to the Son, to Jesus. No one else has given that role. And our role... Is to point to him. That's our role. Just like, you know, when you see the, the, the movies out there, they have the main actor or actress, and what do they call everybody else? The supporting actors and actresses. They support. That's their job. To support the main storyteller. And that's what we do. We're the supporting actors in God's plan. Pointing towards the star pointing towards Jesus. Now maybe maybe some of you here, maybe even, you're like, part of God's plan? Maybe you don't even know you're part of God's plan. Maybe you're not. Because there's only one way to be part of that, and that is to 
believe in the one who's the star. Believe in the star of the show, and that's Jesus. Of course you're like, well, why would I believe in him? Why do we need to believe in him? Because everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen short. Anybody here perfect? Oh, good. I'm glad to see nobody raise their hands. Except for your pastor who throws his hand like that. So. Well, I'm not perfect either. So we all know this. We know that even our own selves, we have moral imperfection. We just know that. Some of us try to cover it up. Try to cover it up with, you know, drugs, alcohol, lying, cheating, whatever we can do to try to cover it up. It never covers it up. Because there's only, because we don't, we don't need a covering, we need a cleansing. And that cleansing is found in Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in him gets eternal life. That eternal life comes from being cleansed of their sin. Being redeemed. Being justified. Fancy word. Always love justified. It's with clothes. Justified. To be declared innocent. To be as if you had never sinned. That is awesome. Everybody's like, big terms. We're like scared of big terms sometimes. Justification. Oh, what is this? Just as if you had never sinned. That's where Jesus puts us. We get put into, inserted into the plan. Praise God. Father, we just thank you. For the truth of your scripture, the truth of your word. Lord, thank you so much for the salvation that you brought us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you not only saved us, but then you make us part of your plan. And I just pray for all of us, Lord, that we would, every day, we would say, okay, Lord, what's my role in the plan today? What do you have for me in your plan? And then keep our eyes open. See how we can point to this star of the show every day. Help us, Lord, to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship him one more time.